All right, so we've been going through the book of Esther. Uh, tonight, uh, we're most likely going to finish Esther 7 and 8 uh, because it kind of is uh, compiled, if you will, into one story. So who can tell me when Esther was written? Back in the day. Back in the day. You're right. Back in the day. Anybody got like a time frame? We, we have a time frame of when Esther might have been written. Anybody? Anybody? All right. Here's the time frame. The time frame of Esther was written. 485 BC. What did you say? 485 BC. 485 BC. Okay, that's good. You're very close. 483 to 473. Good job. Is the is the frame of the story. That's when it took place. But we believed it to be written somewhere between 470 and 424. Um, we're not quite sure when, but that's kind of like when it possibly was written. But the story itself took place within those 10 years of King uh, Xerxes, the King of Persia, um, and 483. Uh, seven, or 473 BC. Who could tell me one interesting fact about the book of Esther? Yes, it doesn't mention God. It doesn't mention God. She has been wanting to say that. Uh, it doesn't mention the name of God. Uh, however, it alludes to God, right? Throughout yeah. the entire uh, and throughout the entire book. Um, what is something else? It's what? It's one of two female books, exactly. Uh, that's, there's, what's the other one? Who can name it? Ruth. 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 There you go. Good job. <laughs> Who did you say? What? Ruth. 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 There you go, Ruth. Ruth. All right. Uh, what is it? Does anyone, there's another interesting fact we mentioned about uh, the book of Esther. Does anybody know what that may be? Look at you writing notes down. No mention of the New Testament. There you go. Uh, it is one of the only books that Jesus does not quote in the New Testament, um, as he quoted many of the Old Testament books. Uh, this is one of the ones that he does not. So once again, we ask quite often, how in the world did it get in our Bible? What, what is the purpose of Esther? And tonight, we're going to get more into that. But does anybody know the overall theme? Sandra, you're not on answer. <laughs> anybody know That's the overall theme? Does anybody here. else know the overall theme of Esther? What's the overall theme? Grace. Grace. Well, maybe you can see Grace in Esther, for sure. Anybody remember the theme of Esther? the Jewish people. The what? They were people, the Jewish people. Save the Jewish people, yes, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's, that's it. I mean, I think that's the most important part of the, of the whole thing. That's it, it's, it's definitely it's it. So I'm looking for a word. That's there, that's, you're right on what? No, 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 no. All right, here we go, I'm going to give it to you. Obedience. Obedience is one. And it's the faithfulness of and God, God right? right? So it's both. It is, it's, it's a duality of, it is God's, this is the way I like to put it. This is God's response to Israel's obedience. Does that make sense? It's not yes. that obedience provokes God uh, necessarily to, to bless you in the sense of like, uh, we have a lot of uh, theology that like, oh, if I do this strict order of the law, if I live up to these standards, then God's just going to do all these amazing things. But that's not really how God works. And so, but there is an element of God responding to our obedience, being faithful to us out of our obedience. So that's what we see through this story. The overall theme is, you know, as we see, uh, as we see the faithfulness of God through the obedience of Esther when she goes before King Xerxes. So does anybody know what Esther 8, 9 is? Esther 8, 9 is the longest verse in the Bible. That is a quiz question. Look at you. You are Where's killing it. You are killing it. I'm going to give out some prizes. I mean, you are just remembering all of this. Uh, the other thing is memory. The other thing is memory. Yeah, you didn't do that. Oh, right, oh, listen up, listen oh okay. Up. Hold on, listen up. All right, the other main thing is that this entire book is about the, uh, it turns into the Jewish festival of Purim, or Purim which is uh, the holiday of deliverance, if you will, of the Jews. Um, and we're going to get into that topic tonight because what was taking place, and if you were here last time, Andy actually led it and did a great job explaining um, chapter 6 and 7. And in chapter 6 and 7, what we see is, a moment where Haman, who if you remember anything about Haman, he is from the King uh, Agag, or the Agagite, right. uh, which is 
part of the Amalekites, which is another, it just kind of keeps going back in lineage, but they were the people that has always hated God's people, always hated the Jews, always hated Israel. So King Agag is an evil king back in the Old Testament, and he hated Israel, and this is Haman. He comes from that same lineage, and so just by knowing his lineage, we know that he already has it out for these people. And then Mordecai not bowing to him as he would come in and out. Remember how Mordecai expected everyone to bow to him, or not Mordecai, excuse me, uh, Haman expected everyone to bow to him, and we saw the uh, uh, the correlation, if you will, um, between the book of Daniel and the book of Esther, how even in Daniel, Daniel came in and they said, hey, uh, bow to every day you're supposed to bow here, and he says, no, I'm not going to do it. Well, then just like Esther, she gives Mordecai sackcloth, and she's like, cover up, just like Daniel. They're like, well, just eat this food, and he's like, no, I'm not doing it. And you see all these correlations between God and, and, and God's faithfulness, and the reason I believe that is because this took place just shortly after the timing of when uh, the book of Daniel, when Daniel would have been in exile. This is shortly after Israel's freedom from exile, right? Um, this is the portion of their freedom uh, in exile. They were finally free after 70 years. So many people would have known about Daniel, and they would have seen this correlation between Mordecai being uh, not following what Xerxes was doing. He was going against the Persian king, which if you think back, this looks just like what Nebuchadnezzar was doing with Babylon. Because remember, Nebuchadnezzar was, they were the great and mighty Babylon. But when Persia came in and took over Babylon, do you remember how much of the, the world Persian, the Persian, Persia owned, the empire? Almost like one third of, uh, three thirds of the world. Almost half, almost, 24%. There is still, if you that, the Persian empire to this day is still the largest empire to have ever existed covering 44% of the world. So imagine being a Jew once again. You're promised all these things from God. You are God's chosen people in the sense of that God chose you to represent him in this earth. He promised the fulfillment to you. He delivered on that promise. The 70 years of exile is up. It's over. But now you don't have what you thought you were going to have. They expected the kingdom. They expected things to be back to normal. Full on restoration. And, and we see that that's not how God worked. God still had other things in plan, so, or in play. So what was taking place is because Mordecai eventually wouldn't bow down, we know that there was a decree set, and Haman asked the, the king, he said, hey, there's some people that are taking over your land, and they're not listening to uh, your decrees. And so what does he do? He gives Haman his signet ring, King Xerxes, which is the ring that no one would have, uh, or excuse me, it solidifies any letter or anything like that that's sent out from a kingdom. And, and he gave it to Haman, representing that Haman now has all the authority in the land to call any shots and to say anything on behalf of King Xerxes, right? So there's your quick history lesson. Let's jump in. This is what's happening. We saw that, oh, sorry, one more thing I forgot to mention. Uh, after that, he set out the decree to kill all the Jews on March 7th. And when that happened, he was going to say March 7th of next year, all the Jews would be killed. Well, of course, Mordecai goes to uh, Esther. It's says, Esther, this can't happen. Uh, who's to say that you are not queen for such a time as this? Maybe this is why Esther ends up going before Xerxes. He hears her out uh, uh, about her request. And so what is going on is that she has scheduled a dinner with Haman and King Xerxes, and they showed up. And then Xerxes says, what can I do for you? What, what's your request? Because she came to him originally with a request, but she doesn't give it. So she invites him to another dinner, and that's where we are now. We're at the second dinner, and this is going to be started in chapter 7. Would anybody like to start reading uh, verse 1? Chapter 7? Chapter 7. And read, uh, if you don't mind, just read through 10, the, the entire chapter. So the king and Haman went to see Esther's banquet. On this second occasion, while they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, Tell me what you want, Queen Esther. What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. Queen Esther replied, If I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who will kill slaughter and annihilate us. 
If we, if we had merely been sold as slaves, I could remain quiet. But that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. Who would do such a, such a thing? King Servant commanded. Who would, do, who would be so uh, presumptuous as to touch him? Esther replied, this wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and went out in the palace garden. All right, stop there. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to hold off real quick, and then I'm gonna, we'll, we'll jump back in, but that's a good place to stop. So what we see here is Haman and, and Xerxes and Esther finally at a banquet, and Esther's going to reveal something major here. She's not only going to reveal that Haman is not a trustworthy person, whom the king has already given his entire authority to. Could you imagine giving your authority over and then realizing, oh wait, this person's not for me. And, and that's what he did. And if you remember back, we talked about how Xerxes kind of seems to be like a follower, right? Like, he seems to be really uh, pushy in, in a lot of, uh, in, in many historical ways, to, just reading about him. And, you know, anybody that says anything, he seems to just be like, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's try this. Yeah, sure. Here, take my ring. Yeah, make a decree. But something interesting that is taking place in this moment is the decree that was made, Xerxes has no idea who the people are. So even in this moment, Xerxes never asked. If you think back to the original story, all Haman said was there is a group of people. A small group, they're nothing too big, but if they multiply and they're in there, they're dangerous because they're not following the decrees of who they are. Now, Haman not telling Xerxes who these people were, Xerxes would have had no, no idea. All he knew was that there were some people against him. So, hey, that makes sense. Let's get them killed. Let's get them out of here. So they start with this process of annihilation. Well, King Xerxes does not realize, obviously, that Esther is of that lineage, and he doesn't realize that her lineage is the one that is being targeted. So in this moment when they're at the dinner and he says, hey, what is your request? Finally, tell me what your request is. And she starts unraveling this story. She starts saying, telling the story about how, you know, my people are going to be killed. You know, my people have been sold off to be killed. And, and that's just what's going to happen because you remember Haman's going to pay the temple treasury all this money to have them annihilated and all this, or excuse me, the treasury to the, to the king. Um, to have these people annihilated. So she, she starts building up this story. And, and being Haman, you have to imagine, he starts to realize, like, wait a minute. Like, she starts, the thing she's saying sounds very familiar to the decree that I just wrote. And the Bible even says that he went pale. Because Haman, once again, hates the Jews. But now his one and only uh, boss, if you will, the person that he's closest to, the one he's buddy-buddy with, the one that he's really trying to take over the empire, he realizes that his wife is the very person he's trying to kill. So obviously as she's unfolding this story, Haman realizes, man, I've been tricked. Think about it. Haman thought, oh man, this is awesome. I'm going to a banquet with the queen. Like he's telling all his boys, like, hey, the queen invited me to a banquet. This is crazy. And oh, guess what? How was the banquet, man? It was awesome. We drank wine. We had a good time. And I'm coming back tomorrow night. We're doing it again. Like we're just really bonding, right? Like <laughs> Haman's like, man, this is, this is what I thought. This is how it's supposed to be. And then all of a sudden she starts talking about her request. And it's like, she doesn't just make the request, yet all she says is like, my people, my people have been sold off. And she said, you know, it would be better for us just to be in slavery, not to be dead, not to be killed. And the king is he's mortified by this. He's like, hold on, who in the world would, would touch my wife? Like, who would touch my bride? And he's like, Obviously, Haman sitting there, uh, this is not good for me. And then when she points to Haman and says, this guy's our enemy, he's the one that did this. She reveals this big secret that she had been hiding. Because up until this point, he still had no idea that she was a, she was, she was a Jew. The Bible said that she hid that. And so when this decree was set out, 
the, the, excuse me, the king did not realize that the decree itself would kill his wife as well. So what does he do? He, he steps in in this moment and he allows something uh, that we'll call grace, if you will. The king ends up leaving. And I want you to see this gospel story within this. You see the bride of a king this being attacked by an enemy. But yet you see the king stepping in on behalf of the bride. So I want you to think about that in relation to us as being the church. We are what? The bride of Christ. We have an enemy in this world. And he's attacking us all the time. The Bible says we do not battle in flesh and blood, but we battle in the principalities and the spirits and all these other realms, in the, in the spiritual realms, meaning that there is a real life enemy. We like to talk about the Holy Spirit a lot, but we don't talk about the evil spirits enough. And they're real. Like that's the reality that there are real things. We were actually taking our, our mission team, I'm working with them throughout this week, and we've been doing door hangers and all kind of crazy stuff. That's why I look burnt. I look Cuban now. Yeah. Uh, not yet? You get me? All right. Uh, no. But, you know, we're, we're, we're doing all these things, but one of them came back and they were telling us a story about something they saw. And they were like, man, yeah, we saw this uh, dead chicken in the driveway. And I was like, really? I was like, uh, I think Marco was, were you there? Yeah, man, we started talking. We were asking, like, what if it, was it just a dead chicken? Like, like, no, the head was chopped off. And we're like, oh. That's like Santeria. They're doing yeah. definitely sacrifices. And these kids were like, what? We're like, yeah, that's, you know, that, that's normal. That's, that's, that's good. That's that's coming thing. in from the islands. They're doing these things. Worship. To, and so I say that to remind all of us that there are people that worship these evil spirits. And I'm telling you this because I've seen it with my own eyes. They don't worship them out of hope that they'll show up. They worship them because they've seen them. They worship them because they've seen things float. They've seen fires appear. They've seen things stand before them. They've had things talk to them. I have personally witnessed things like this. So people that believe in this voodoo and believe in this stuff, they believe in it because they've seen it. And what bothers me most is that we have people that believe in things like that more than we believe in the God that created these demonic forces, if you will. They rebelled against him in heaven. They said that, they weren't, that he wasn't good enough them, but yet there are real life people that they see these things and we battle in this spiritual realm every single day. And so in the same way, even in this story, we can see the gospel and how the king, our king, Jesus, he steps in for us all the time in these battles when the enemy is attacking. And we see right now, this is where the king begins to step in. He realizes what's taking place. He realizes that Haman is a really bad dude and he's killing his wife. But now he's, or me, he's killing all of his wife's people, which ultimately is going to have to have his wife killed. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So the king is the one that set up the tree and Haman is the one that's being killed? No. Yes, yeah. Uh, so Haman is the king's right-hand man, right. and he decided that everybody started bowing down to Haman as just a high, high person in the kingdom, and he decided that because Mordecai wasn't going to bow down, that he that all the Jews needed to be killed. So he decided that all the Jews needed to be killed. He tells the king. They send out the decree. The king allows Haman to write it. You'll have to go back. You missed the one that we You need to go back and read the chapter, and you'll catch up. But Haman's a bad guy. And he he wrote a decree, and the king, very and the king is and is he very in, easily influenced by whoever, right. uh, anybody, really anybody. Yeah. Um, and so in reality, the signet ring is a is very significant because the signet ring, once again, it all authoritates anything that the king would send. It would be like a stamp that they would right. put in wax. They put it on something, and that would say, "Hey, this is the king's signet saying this." So what a king would often do is put someone else in power, in authority, so that they can make shots and make calls and make decisions. And so that's what he did with Haman, who's a very evil person. And so the decree was to have the Jews killed. So now the problem, yes, ma'am. And the king didn't know that she was Jewish. Does not know that she's Jewish. The king does not know that she's Jewish up until this moment. So the problem is not only that he finds out that she's Jewish, once again, see the gospel, there is something that has taken place that cannot be changed. Do you remember what it is? 
the decree. If you read in Daniel, you see the same thing. Any decree written between the Persians and the Medes, it cannot be revoked. So now, this guy's in a catch-22. He realizes, okay, anything in the order of the king, it can't be revoked. So the decree must happen. Death must come. But it's going to kill my bride. So in a sense, do you see how the gospel, sin entered the world. It happened. Nothing we can do. It, 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 you can't change that. All that can happen is something can, can provide a, a grace for that. Can, can provide another option, if you will, a covering for that. And so what happens is in this moment, we see the king and he leaves uh, because he's obviously upset. He's not sure what he can, what to do because he realizes, you know, my, the decree's been sent. It's got to happen. There's nothing we can do about it. You cannot change the decree of the person who meets. And if we do, or if, and because of that, now my wife is in danger. So he leaves. Somebody pick up real quick and read in verse 8 through 10. There's three quick verses. Is it sir, is it fair? Yes. Is it fair he fell on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining? Just as the king was returning from the palace garden, the king exclaimed, Will he even assault the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? And as soon as the king spoke, his attendants covered him in state, signaling his doom. Then Arbona, one of the king's eunuchs, said, Haman has set up a sharpened pole. Thus then 75 feet tall in his own courtyard. He intended to use it to impale Mordecai, the man who saved the king from assassination. Then impale Haman on it, the king ordered. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. So, that's pretty gruesome, right? So what we see here is the king, uh, Mordecai had already, excuse me, Haman had already planned out the death of Mordecai. He figured this is done, this is how it's going to go, we've already set the decree, everything's good. He would have never imagined what was going to take place. He would have never imagined that Esther would have been who she was, that this would have been revealed, that something would have come about of this. So by this happening, all of a sudden he's prepared to have him killed. He's prepared to, uh, to put him on this big, uh, this big pole. And... The king, so the king steps out of the courtyard, and he comes back in, and in this moment, Haman is basically pleading for his life, right? He is pleading to Queen Esther, please don't kill me, I didn't know, whatever, you know, whatever he wants, just pleading, and then to the point where he, he falls on her, and it's the worst timing, it's when the king comes in. Now, this is really bad, because she's reclining on a couch, and now the king walks in and sees another man on her, like laying on top of her, right? That's not good for him. He's trying to like save his life. That's not a good place to start. You know, there's actually a Jewish story. This is real life that uh, they say uh, it's, a, it's a Jewish fable, if you will. They say that they believe that the hand of God actually pushed Haman onto the wife uh, to get him killed. That's actually a, a Jewish fable that they tell that they they would say that the hand of God actually uh, pushed Haman onto her. Uh, so, in, in, in to, so that the king would see. And so, of course, the king is more angry. He sees this, and he assumes, well, obviously, if this man wants all these Jews dead, he's probably trying to kill my wife right here. So he says, is he really that dumb? Is he, re like, is he really going to do this in front of me? Is he really going to do like ass assault the queen right here? And then all of a sudden, the, the eunuch steps in, and he's like, hey, this is what he also did. He prepared for the death of your wife by setting this pole. He already prepared for it. He already put these, these, this trap out there, this, this thing that's going to that's gonna kill him. Let's, let's just put him on it. And so that's what he, he the, the king decides. He says, you know what? That's the best thing. Let's, 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 let's kill him. Let's put Haman on the very thing that Haman thought he was going to put Mordecai on. And notice what the eunuch says in this moment. He doesn't just say to, uh, to him uh, that, it, that it's just Mordecai. He reminds him who Mordecai is. He says, the one that saved the king. See, he reestablishes 
Mordecai, now think about this in your own life, think about this in this time. Mordecai went from a nobody to being in the palace to all of a sudden being someone that everybody recognized as being in mourning, looking like a fool, sackcloth on, not willing to change, not willing to do anything, because he knew what God had promised. He knew that God had promised to be faithful. He knew that Israel was not going to be defeated in the long run. He knew that over time, no matter what, at the end of the day, God's plan was going to come to pass. And so what did he do? He remained steadfast and he remained faithful. Now, I know this story is often just focused in on Esther, but also we have to look at the faith of Mordecai. You know, sometimes for a lot of us, it takes the faith of someone else to push us to do what we should do. Have you ever noticed that so when you're around somebody full of faith, sometimes that, that makes you more full of faith. You know, it's kind of like, man, like, if this person believes it, like, well, then I kind of believe it, right? Like, sometimes people make you do crazy things. It's like, I mean, I, you know, wow, they think you can fly. Like, maybe we can fly. Let's do it, right? Nobody? You're not going to jump? Oh, man, I thought I had you. We're about to go out of here. So. No, but in re so there, but seriously, there's sometimes it's, it takes other people in our lives to actually see, uh, or excuse me, to press us into the places that God wants us to be. Sometimes it takes someone else telling us, hey, maybe this is why you're here. Maybe you could do this. We talked about the power of the perhaps, and perhaps it will actually work. Perhaps this is why. And, and, and sometimes it takes us, I love what Paul says um, in one of his letters to one of the churches, and I don't remember which one it is, uh, but I'm going to preach it one day. I have it in my notes. Uh, I'll have to look it up. But Paul says this, and, and I call it faith gaps, because he, he, he says, thank you for the report that you gave. I want to say it was to Timothy, uh, because it filled the gap in my faith. And, and I started thinking about that, like, you know, a lot of times we have faith gaps that it's like we need to jump from here to here. And sometimes it takes somebody to come into our life by saying, hey, you can do it. And they feel that. They're like a faith gap for you. And there's actually someone in, in our lives, I'll share this story, that, that is, was kind of that way for us. And I was sharing this with him recently as I came across it in Scripture. Um, and he was telling me, he's like, man, I just feel bad. Like, I want to be down there with you guys. I want to be down there with you guys. I want to be down there with you guys. And a lot of you guys don't know this family, but the Presley family uh, was a family that originally helped start this church with us. They moved from South Carolina to Florida. Um, he moved three months before I moved, uh, but he couldn't get down to Miami. So he was two hours, two and a half hours north, and him and his family, for the first several months, they drove, and they were a part of the start of this church. And I'll never forget how it came about. He came to me one day after I preached. I never met the guy. came to me and he said, hey, God told me that you're supposed to start a church. It's not going to be in South Carolina, and I'm supposed to go with you. And I was like, you're crazy. Like, I remember calling Brittany, telling her I met a crazy guy. I'm probably going to call school. I'm not going to say I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I was like, he's like, he, he said this, and I said, you know, you mean crazy? I'm like, that's weird. And sure enough, he was one of the families that, that he, he filled that faith gap because he constantly reaffirmed it in our lives. You can. You can do this. Man, God has shown me what is possible. And, and I told him recently on the phone, I said, dude, you're not supposed to be here, but you were supposed to be in that gap when I needed you. Because there's a story that I've shared with many of you, but some of you don't know this, but me and Brittany almost didn't come to Miami. We decided to come to Miami. And about a month later, I decided that God told us not to. And I told everybody we were. For a month and a half, we were not going. We were not coming. We were planting in South Carolina a place called Greer. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. You know why? Because 51 minutes away from where we grew up, we didn't know anybody there, but it was a cool little spot. We could start something. We could have a good following. We had a worship team willing to follow us. We had a production team ready to go. And all of a sudden, I remember one day being in the gym, and this guy came up to me, and I, he never works out in this gym. I don't even know why he was there, and, but he was a children's leader at two churches with me. And he came to me and he said, hey, I heard you're starting a church. I said, yeah, man, I'm so excited. We're going to career, blah, 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 you know. Blah. And he's like, oh, great. You can be like every other pastor that gets mad and goes starts a church to another church. 
And I was like, I want to punch you. <laughs> and now my pastor, that I, a guy I consider my pastor, he, he was working out with me uh, at the time, and, and he kind of just looked because he remembered me talking about Miami and how we were going to Miami and this and this and this, and then all of a sudden we're going to Greer. And then this guy calls me out about it, and I remember I left the gym immediately that day, and I went straight home, and, and it was like 8 o'clock, and I grabbed Brittany, I said, get in the car. She said, why? I said, we're going to Greer. She said, what for? I said, because I got to know. She said, know what? I got to know. I don't know what I need to know, but I need to know something. Is this where we're going? We drove an hour, a pouring down rain. She was so mad. She did not want to do this. She's like, we can go another. I'm like, no. It was a Monday night. I'll never forget rain. it. Monday night, rainy. She had to teach the next day. I'll never forget it. Pouring down rain, we're going up there, and all of a sudden, we hit this road, Highway 29, that goes through Greer, where I was like, this is where we're going to be. And you see church plant coming, 2018, church plant coming, 2018, 19, church plant. We just kept seeing church, 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 church. I'll never forget, I pulled over to a Chevrolet parking lot, and I broke down and started crying, and I told Brittany, I said, I'm so sorry, but it's my end. Okay. <laughs> But the reason at the time I was sorry is because I knew we were taking, I knew the sacrifice. You know, I knew what it was going to take. I knew that we were moving away from family and friends. And so I remember, I'll tell you this, because I called Jeremy that night on the phone. And I said, Jeremy, I'm sorry, because he had four kids. Four little kids. And when I told them Greer, man, his wife was ecstatic they were staying in South Carolina. And then I called him, I said, man, I'm sorry. Miami, we got to move. If you don't feel led, you don't have to. But that's what we have to do. And his exact words to me was, John Michael, when you told me Greer, I felt like you were stealing something from me. Because I knew God had so much more than that. And now the man is doing incredible things at another church plant in just two and a half hours up north. And like they needed him so when he like and it's exactly where God wants him and his family. But in that moment, for him and his family, they were that faith gap that I needed to stand before what would be a holy God, completely unworthy, but to say, here I am, send me. And, and they filled that faith gap. And you know, Mordecai in this story, he acted as that faith gap for Esther. Yeah, Esther stood before the king, but she would have never done it had that person not came into her life and said, hey, you can actually do it. And you know what else? Esther, no one else can. Now, I want you to think about that. You know, each one of you have your own personal path in this life that only you can live out, that only you can live it. Can't, and the problem that we have is quite often we try to live in someone else's lane, right? We try to live in what someone else is calling, someone else is gifting, someone else's thing, someone else's, and we try to find ourselves in someone else's lane because we don't like our lane. But, you know, in this moment, Mordecai, he tells Esther back in, in, in chapter 4, he tells her, he says, look, at the end of the day, the, the Jews, God's going to redeem his people. Do not forget that. But right now, you're the only one. You're the only one that he can use to do it. In this moment. Not to say that he will, oh, he's going to redeem his people. Don't you go, oh, don't worry. But right now, he's put you in a position and in a place and in a power that only you have. And see, he acted as that faith gap, reminding her of who she was the position she held, the power that she had. And see, some of you, I feel like that we need to be reminded not only who we are in Christ, but of our giftings that He's given us and the lanes that we should be walking in, not in our own authority, but in the authority of Christ because He has given us a purpose. He has given us something here to do. He has not just created you to live this life. No, He's placed you exactly where you are for a purpose. But sometimes if you're so focused on everybody else's lane and everybody else's thing, then you're missing the very thing that God has for you. 
But see, because Mordecai stood in that gap and he became that faith gap. Now, here's the thing. There's one of two people in this room. Either you need somebody who's a faith gap right now or you need to be a faith gap to somebody right now. And I can't tell you where you are, but I can tell you that that's where we all are. <laughs> Myself included. I had a lady tell me today, she came in, and I, and I just my head faith gap. She said, man, every time I talk to you, I just feel so encouraged. And I said, well, I'm so glad because I don't feel that way when I talk. <laughs> and she said, well, you know, I, I get it. Because she kind of, she does a lot of ministry stuff. And I said, I feel you. I said, but, you know, thank you so much. That's a faith gap. But see, we all need those moments. We all have that. So Mordecai was that to Esther. And because Mordecai was that to Esther, and Esther was obedient. Now listen, not to Mordecai but to the truth of who God was. See, by Mordecai revealing that God is still God, he's going to provide. It's either through you or not. That's, that's up to you. Are you going to give him what you got? Or are you going to withhold it? Are you going to go stand before the king because you actually have the ability to and nobody else does? Or are you going to not? Well, what are you going to do, Esther? Because God is the same God that said that I will deliver my people regardless of it's through you or not. So what, uh, what Esther was obedient to was not to Mordecai, but to the promise that God was faithful. And so because of her obedience to the fact that God is faithful, then she didn't care whether or not she was killed by the king or whether or not she was redeemed by him. Why? Because she would have been considered a child of God. She would have been considered one of God's chosen people and, and her obedience would have been honoring the very God that she served. But because of her obedience, what do we see? We see God's faithfulness. He began to use Esther to set up a very plan that was going to end up getting the enemy out of the way. That was going to end up putting the enemy on this stake. That was going to end up putting the enemy out of Esther's life. And that's exactly what we see happen. They end up going and killing him and now I'm gonna I'm gonna continue because this is why I'm gonna rush to this part because this is uh, the same thing but it's the ending if you will. It says this on the same day King Xerxes gave the property of Haman the enemy of the uh, of the Jews to Queen Esther. Then Mordecai excuse me the property the enemy of the Jews to Queen Esther then Mordecai was brought before the king for Esther had told the king how they were related. So we see here that all of a sudden on the same day, everything that was Haman's now became uh, Esther's. Everything that was his became uh, hers. And so then she relates. She tells him how Mordecai and her are related. And so what does he do? The king took off his signet ring, which he had taken back from Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai to be in charge of Haman's property. How crazy is that? Uh, Haman thought like he was going to get Mordecai out of here. He thought, man, I'm coming up. I'm doing all this stuff. But once again, God is working behind the scenes. And the very thing that Haman thought that he was getting, Mordecai ends up getting. Everything that Mordecai thought he was losing, he was actually gaining. You know, sometimes that's how life looks for us. We look and we see it looks like, man, the enemy seems to be succeeding right now. It seems to be that everything that I thought what I was that, that my life might have looked like or I was going to get or I was going to do this or whatever it may be, it, it, it seems to be that the enemy is just winning or either that or God's not around, right? Like it just seems like either God's not real or the enemy must be succeeding in my life right now. But, you know, sometimes that's not, it's not black and white. It's not so cut and dry like that. You realize God is so much greater than we can imagine. And there are times in our lives that it may look like the enemy is winning, but God is really behind the scenes working everything out for the good. What does he say? For those who have been called according to his purpose. The church. Me and you. Believers in Christ. So it may look like the enemy is on time. It may look like these things are happening, but it's not. that's not how God works. No, he's working behind the scenes. And so we see that. He says, look, everything that was the enemy's is now Esther's. Everything that was supposed to kill Mordecai, Mordecai has it all. There's been times in my life, too, you know, you look at people and you're like, man, like, 
how are, like, how, why are they succeeding? And I'm not, like, God, I'm, like, trying my best. Like, I, I, you know, I stopped doing this, or I started doing this, or, man, I'm doing this more, I'm doing this more. But, like, man, we're, you know, it's almost like we expect from God because we're doing for God. You know, God, this is real life for me right now. I'll just be honest with you. There are times that uh, I, I ask God, I'm like, God, I quit drinking for you. <laughs> right? Like, when you going to, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, some, some back. yeah, like, well, you know what? God, I, yeah, God, what you going to give me? And you know what God reminded me of this recently when I said that to, you know, when I contemplate, because I do this quite often, I say, God, but I did like, man, I've done a lot of things for you, dude. <laughs> moved my family, moved there. Then not only I gave up drinking, like that was gonna be like, I was at least like a good thing. Like, I was I was helping. God's like, I wasn't. Helping. <laughs> but you know, God reminded me, he's like, You're asking me what I'm going to do for you? Not just sit myself for you, but then you're my man. Wait, you think you quit drinking? I helped you with that. I already did what, it, what, 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 what did you expect? You, you hated your life. I freed you. But how often do we want something physical? We say, God, I'm doing for you. But you know, sometimes what God does for us doesn't look like the physical, but it really looks like breaking free from the bondage that in reality we know deep down in our hearts we've always wanted to be free from. And he finally does it, and then we say, God, what are you going to give me for doing this? And he says, I gave you the freedom from it. I gave you the, the peace in it. I gave you the hope through it. I gave you the strength to endure it. I gave you the ability to forgive it. See, we, we're like, but God, where are you? like the enemy might be succeeding or gaining ground, if you will, 
real in our lives because that's what it looked like. It looked like Haman was gaining ground. It looked like the, the Persian army was just going to continue, not just 44%, but 45%, 46%, 70% of the world, to the point where all of a sudden the Jews would be nothing and the promise of God that they would be multiple, of, of, uh, numerous above the stars and the sand and all these things. That hope and that faith and that dream, that started to dwindle. But all of a sudden, God's working behind it. It looks like the enemy's gaining ground, but in reality, the enemy's not gaining ground. God's just setting him up. But it, here's, here's the big kicker. God is setting the enemy up in your life, but it's going to take you to be obedient to what he's telling you to do for him to be faithful to it. If you want the enemy, if you want that, whatever that is, if you want it, that, that thing to go away, I promise you the Bible says that through every temptation, God always provides a way out. What does that mean? He, he gives us an opportunity, a way He's giving you, He's providing you with whatever's happening, He's going to provide it. And what it takes is obedience to the option that He's giving you of the way out. And guess what? When you're obedient to that, God meets you there with His faithfulness. And this is what we see happening is that Mordecai was obedient. When it looked like the enemy was gaining ground, he stayed faithful. He did not give up. Even to the point that he was willing to press his own uh, niece to the point of, look, you have to go do this. I believe in our God so much that I would not risk your life if I did not know God was God. Think about that. More God wasn't just like, yo, go try it out. <laughs> right? Like, I didn't his word. He had faith. The only thing was he had to fill that gap in Esther's faith to remind her of who God was, to remind her of God's faithfulness. And then because of her obedience, we see... God meeting her and meeting his people in that faithfulness and allowing this opportunity, if you will, this grace to intercede for the punishment that has to come. Because it was already written by the law of the Persians and the Medes that this was going to take place. But there was an outlet that God provides, and you'll see that in a couple weeks. But I want you to be encouraged this week. I want you to be encouraged by the story. Sometimes it does look like that. Sometimes it doesn't like moments where we have to have faith in God. We need people to step in and just say, hey, you know, you can do this. And, 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 and hear me out. I'm not saying like in some, you know, Oprah went free kind of way. Like, hey, you can do this. You can do I, I, I say that in a way of sometimes we need to be encouraged in the things we're already doing. But then sometimes we need to be an encouragement to somebody. You know, sometimes we need to remind people of who God is. And sometimes we need to be reminded of who God is. It doesn't make anybody any less of a person. It just means we're in a different season. And that's how we balance each other as the church. That's why we do what we do here. That's why we're family. Because there's going to be days that you guys are low. And there's going to be days that you guys are high. But at the end of the day, when you're both balancing each other out, because those who are in the low moments, you can come in and say, man, God has you, man. Remember, look what's going on in my life. And I know for you in the low moment, it's hard to look at that person right now. You're like, I don't want to look at what's going on in your life. What we, we don't covet, right? So instead, we celebrate. Why do we celebrate what's happening in other people's lives? Because when we see it happening in other people's, it reminds us that God can do it for us. It reminds us, man, praise God, this is happening for you. Because that just that gives me hope that, man, he hasn't forgotten about me. So keep those things in mind. Where are you at? Or maybe you need a faith filler. Or maybe you need to fill someone's faith today. Maybe you're like a Mordecai right now, and you're like, look, God is faithful. Or maybe you're like an Esther right now, and you need to be reminded a little bit. Maybe you feel like the enemy's been gaining ground in your life. Well, I, I, I got news for you. God's still God. He's still very who he said. He's still the very strong, same God that can defeat anything and anybody that is coming and going against you. He is still the same one that brought you, that made you, that created you, that knows you, that loves you, that cares about you. Nothing has changed about him. Things might have changed around around you, but nothing's changed about God. God is still the same God. And I promise you this, if you continue in obedience to Him, He will continue in faithfulness to you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's
pray. Father, thank you so much. But we thank you for your faithfulness. God, we thank you that we are able to come before you because of who your son Jesus is. That just like in this story, Father, the enemy that was coming against us and coming against this world, coming against all of humanity, Father, you dethroned that enemy by dying on a cross for us, by defeating death. The one thing that he had over us, God, you took from him, you stole from him, and you've given us life back. God, thank you so much for the life that we live. God, I just ask that right now, whether we need to be filled in our faith or, God, whether we need to fill others, Lord, that you would, you would make us those faith feelers. And, Father, that you would also allow us to receive when someone is, is, is being that, that, that place for us, filling that gap for us. Lord, let us recognize it. Let us see it. And God, I just know and I believe so greatly in your promises and how faithful you are. So, Father, we know right now that no matter where we sit, God, no matter where we are, no matter where we're standing, God, we know that we're standing in your power, we're standing in your love, in your grace, in your truth, and in your mercy. Father, we are children of the living God. And there's nothing that can take that away. So, Father, no matter what our circumstances look like, I pray that we continue to see the cross we continue to be reminded of what you did for us. Lord, I ask all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Take, feel free if you have questions, ask me. Uh, fellowship, say hey.